Thanks for being, uh, organizers for inviting me here. Um, the title I was given is quite a, a mouthful, and I'll try to cover uh, most of it, but I'll mainly focus on the challenges in using gut microbiota analysis. And in a way, I'll be hammering in the, some of the points that uh, Paul Cotter did uh, previously. So uh, I'll start by uh, plugging a review that we recently published together with uh, Adam Clooney and Paul Tu. Uh, clinician's guide to microbiome analysis, and um, uh, I, I won't go through this in great detail because I, uh, uh, Paul did an excellent uh, summary of that. Uh, but basically, you have uh, once you have sequenced the sample from the gut uh, or, or anywhere really, um, <clears throat> following uh, the appropriate study design and sample collection and, and so on, you have the two. You have the choice of sequencing a marker gene, um, answering uh, who are there, you know, what, what, what bacteria are in the gut. And um, in the, 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 by far the most common uh, marketing would be part of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. Um, you can also sequence transcripts, actually not DNA, but uh, um, rRNA uh, the, the transcripts, and then find out what is, what is the metabolic activity in a way. Uh, but most of these studies sequence the, 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 the gene. Uh, if you're interested in fungi or single cell eukaryotic, you have the option of sequencing either the 18S rRNA gene or the internal uh, transcribed spacer. Um, now, in, if you're instead interested in what, uh, the, in, uh, in the function of the microbiome, you'll be uh, doing shotgun metagenomics or shotgun metatranscriptomics. So you sequence either DNA for metagenomics or RNA for metatranscriptomics. So the first question, the, the first uh, approach would answer what can these bacteria do? Uh, the other one would uh, answer what actually are they doing at that point in time? So um, I won't go through all these um, uh, <coughs> um, points here, which uh, Paul did, uh, but I want to point out some of the uh, disadvantages of using 16S over the other. So uh, you have limited species resolution. Um, we have some tools we're able to go down to species levels, but for uh, quite a big um, for proportion of the, sequen the sequenced amplicon reads, that's, that may not be possible. Uh, you obviously have limited functional info because you just go for that marker gene. Uh, there's also uh, an issue with varying gene copy numbers. So this 16S uh, gene may exist in one or two or three or maybe up to seven or eight copies. So that obviously has an effect on the abundance of these bacteria, uh, how, how you, how you um, analyze them. And obviously there's an amplification bias. So whatever, whichever primer, 16S primers you're using, we give you if you if you vary if you have two different primary pairs, you will get a, uh, a different uh, answer each time. Now, in terms of the shotgun approach, um, it requires more DNA or RNA, um, which is usually not a problem if you do stool samples. But if you, uh, as I have been uh, focusing on as well, um, mucosal biopsies, then you have quite limited uh, microbial DNA. So most of the DNA you get is actually from the host. So it may not be possible to do metagenomics or metatranscriptomics uh, uh, very well. And obviously you have costs, which already been pointed out. It's more than, it could be over an order of magnitude, more expensive per sample to do shotgun uh, approaches. And also in terms of uh, the analytical and computational demands, uh, it, it requires much more, both in terms of you know, actually to process it, to store the data, and uh, it's a higher level of um, expertise to some degree. Okay, so uh, some of the key points we made in this review, uh, I'll just run through them. Uh, I don't think I need to convince you that uh, human uh, microbiome are increasing, have increasingly been linked to various conditions and diseases. Um, uh, this means that uh, it can also be seen as a, a risk factor that can be modified, uh, especially in multifactorial diseases. So that's why we have the um, potential to, uh, novel therapeutics that so many uh, more companies and uh, organizations are looking into. And even if you're not be able to infer causality, so what comes first and uh, uh, the, the micro, microbiome changes or the disease, or uh, exactly how it works, the mechanisms, you may still be able to be possible to use the changes that you just observed in the microbiome uh, for diagnostics or pro prognostics. If, if you can, say, predict something is about to happen in a relapse, in a disease, let's say, and you can see that in the microbiome early on, even if it's not causing that relapse, it may still be very uh, useful. And it is likely this type of analysis to, be, to become a routine component of secondary healthcare. And 
uh, with some of the technology advancements. We talked about sequencing earlier uh, and also analytical uh, advancements. Uh, they're very powerful and they, they will make these uh, technologies much more available and affordable for clinical studies. But this will only happen, uh, happen to, uh, as we want if we pay very close attention to the methodology. So it's very important to, to do that, obviously, that to, to get it right, otherwise you'll be misled. And, and this is something I want to spend uh, my talk on um, here today. Okay, starting with some of the challenges. Data management is an obvious one. These uh, <coughs> machines produce an, all, an awful amount of, of data. So this, um, this um, plot here shows the, the yellow one. The NGS is often next generation sequencing data. So many base pairs you can get per, per dollar. That used to double uh, um, every 19 months. Uh, but then you have uh, the NGS here that double every uh, five months. So that actually outpaces uh, Moore's law. But, but too, not too many people are aware of that actually hard disk storage, how many megabytes um, you can purchase for per dollar, uh, that doubles also, which is good, but it doesn't double as much as uh, sequencing data is generated. So that means we run into more and more uh, issues with storing the data. And what do you store? So uh, this is, I suppose, a slide from um, uh, Noller Illumina, um, a sequencing machine, Illumina Genome Analyzer, but the message is still there. So if you just get the raw data off the machine, uh, it may, from one run, it may count 1.4 uh, terabytes, let's say just images of, of, of this. Uh, and if you do the analysis, it goes down to 300 gigabytes. If you do base calling, 60, sequence analysis, 40. And the line reads, if you line that to some uh, host genome, let's say, that that's much less. So what uh, many scientists use, just to scrap this. The, uh, the, the image analysis is simply too costly and too awkward to store. And if, you're not, if you don't have access to your own uh, sequence, uh, your, your own um, um, high, <coughs> high performance uh, computer service and, and associated SIS administration, um, it's, I recommend to move into cloud computing. So this is uh, both where you can compute the Dune analysis and also store it. So obviously you pay per CPU hours, so you pay by, by, pay by uh, how many gigabytes you store and for a long. Some of the biggest players for this would be Illumina Base Space Sequence Hub and Amazon Web Services, and there are also some more here. Uh, I want to I won't talk about uh, software that much, but uh, I recommend you to take a look at in this review to, to get a, an extensive list of the software and the categories that, that uh, they, they're used for. So, um, there are so many, uh, maybe it's not the most exciting thing to talk about, but I think it's very important for anyone interested in the microbiome to be aware of these things. Uh, there are some uh, technical biases that relate to sampling, storage, DNA extraction, amplification, <coughs> sequencing, of course. And there are some non-technical ones, which you maybe can be seen more as by uh, confounders. You have age, uh, gender diet, BMI, smoking, medication, and so on. And perhaps the biggest uh, contribution Donald Rumsfeld did was summarizing the knowns and unknowns. And um, you can kind of classify some of these biases into what we do know or not know about them. So you can say that uh, there are some known knowns. Uh, let's say if you talk about uh, antibiotics. We know that antibiotics affect the gut microbiota. We also know to roughly to some degree how it does that. Um, <clears throat> there are also some known <coughs> unknowns. We know that um, you'd say if, you're, if you extract DNA in a certain way, you may um, know that it will change it, but you don't know exactly how. And, and then there are some unknowns unknowns as you don't have a clue you, you, that surprise you uh, uh, once you uh, correct it. So, so this is uh, important to be aware of. And I'll start talking about some technical biases here. Um, so when you want to uh, sequence the DNA of bacteria, you need to crack open the cell wall and the cell membrane uh, using DNA extraction methods. And that usually includes a deep beating step where you beat uh, uh, the cell wall down. Uh, you can also actually repeat this. We call it repeat speed beating, uh, which is important to, for especially stubborn cells to, to open up uh, those cell walls. So uh, as part of an LDMET uh, project of the metagenomes of uh, elderly in Cork, which I'll come back to, uh, we did a pilot study where we compared the single bee beating with a repeat bee beating on 70 stool samples. So we, halved, we, we, we took two aliquots of each stool sample. Uh, and this is a 
principal coordinate analysis. So all you need to know about this is that the closer the two samples are to each other in this plot, the closer are their microbiota. And in the yellow here are samples that are repeat beated, and in the red are the, those that are single beat beating, and they're tied together if it came from the same uh, stool sample. And you can immediately see here it has a huge effect. It's a bigger effect than the, in, the inter individual variation, even uh, the fact that you use different DNA extraction methods. So, so that is very something. So, so very important to use the same method throughout the study. And if you really want to compare with another study, uh, outside your own lab, uh, make sure that you use the same protocol for that. And to make matters worse, um, these DNA, commercial DNA extraction kits can sometimes be contaminated. So this was outlined by um, some of the group in uh, the Sanger Institute a few years ago, um, where, where a bunch of bacteria were actually in, in the DNA extraction kit as, as they were received. And uh, this is not a huge deal for stool samples, uh, which have very high biomass, but for low biomass, let's say biopsies or tissues, uh, it's much more important, uh, much more serious. Okay, um, in terms of sequencing, um, we, about 10 years ago, the, the 454 uh, pyrosequencing was uh, the method of choice for, for doing this type of analysis. It's uh, been discontinued since, and we uh, we used it at, at the start of, um, sort of this element project where we sequenced the uh, gut bacteria of hundreds of, um, of uh, elderly people in, in Cork. And this is a, one of those PCOAs where we have in green community, people who live out in the community, red in long stay and, and yellow are young controls. And we kind of see, uh, it's, it's nice to hear that the community have a different gut microbiota overall compared to the long stay and the young controls are in between. So that's, that's, that's all well and good. But the, <coughs> as, as it happens, we were, we were just in the, in the period between two pyrosequencing uh, chain, um, machines. So the older one, which uh, has Flex, uh, it's called Flex, um, it sequenced uh, lower, fewer reads per plate, and the old, new one, Titanium, uh, sequenced more. So we, the first one, we mixed these up. So this is this piece of our samples that we sequenced in both. And when I then colored the very same PCA according to the two sequencers, you see something completely different. You can see there's a huge bias to do with the uh, for, uh, here with the flex compared to the titanium. And luckily, the, the very interesting um, split here that we saw between um, <coughs> community and long stay were not attributed to this change in, in, in sequencing machine. So we, but what we did, did have to do, we couldn't go on with, with, with this uh, with these samples. So we have to scrap all the samples that were uh, sequenced with the old machine and carry on and sequence more with, with the new one. So, oh yeah, this is a, kind of a, a, a jokey slide I put up sometimes. Um, so if you were to sequence on different days, uh, it, I don't expect it to have this big of a big an effect, but it kind of shows the point that uh, even small things, unknown unknowns, might have an effect. If you have different handler uh, from day on day, or you, you send the same you send the same sample to two companies who follow the same protocols, you might have different uh, outcome, unfortunately. So that's something to learn the hard way. And I also want to touch on the bioinformatics side of things. I talked about uh, leading up to sequencing here, but once you've sequenced the samples, uh, uh, you obviously need to process them using software tools. And this is something we did with, in collaboration with uh, Paul, Paul Connors group. So we took six stool sample in a pilot project. Uh, we uh, had three different sequencing platforms. We, we did the shotgun sequencing and uh, six nest sequencing using three different sets of primer pairs. And we had three different binning tools. So binning tool basically tells you, um, it, it kind of organizes the groups, bins, the sequence reads according to uh, bacteria that are most similar. So uh, the perfect binning tool would put all the reads from one species in one bin, all the uh, um, reads from another species another bin. And uh, this um, heat map here, so what you need to be aware of here that each, each column here is one sequenced sample. Okay, remember there are six samples originally, but they were split up in lots of different combinations. So ideally you would have sample, uh, this is clustered according to their, their uh, taxonomy, so their, their composition. Ideally you would have sample one here in red, green, uh, blue, and yellow here, but that's not what we see. We see Instead, that all the samples that we sequence using 16S all grouped together. It's kind of expected. And these are all the shotgun samples here. 
uh, and the DOTA used the uh, uh, Kraken binner, where it sequenced here, where it ended up here. This used the um, Gotcha binner here and the Metaflan here. So, so this huge bioinformatic bias in how this uh, is carried out. So, uh, I won't go into comparing them performance wise, but just to be aware of this. Yeah, some other examples of confounders. Um, this uh, is not directly related to microbiome research, but I still found it very fascinating. A few years ago, um, a study here in Nature Methods showed that um, mice in, in my, uh, mice have been uh, handled by males, uh, men in the lab, uh, were more um, stressed out than mice that were handled by women for some reason. So, so that's that's another that's an unknown unknown to me, and something to be aware of, and something to always keep consistent. So this was uh, this is especially I, this was not a microbiome uh, study, but. Uh, it is important for this audience, I think, uh, if you're involved in behavior studies, to be aware of. Another microbiome uh, study which uh, got a lot of attention back in 2012 was uh, where a big a European and Chinese group um, were able to see differences in the gut microbiota between those who were, uh, had type 2 diabetes and those who were healthy. Now, the same group actually later on found that the reason for this was those uh, those that were on uh, diabetes had uh, the, very, the, the most common drug metformin, uh, and that actually uh, biased uh, the, mi the microbiota in such a way. So you can see here uh, in red are all the samples uh, that uh, from patients who were metformin, metformin, and here are the, the diabetes without that drug, and here are all the companies. Uh, so that's clearly biased, the, this drug clearly biased the microbiome. So that's important to be aware of as well. <laughs> and last, I want to just spend some time on uh, the diet and microbiota. So Orla covered well uh, how, how this related to diet, uh, to exercise. And I want to go back to the element study uh, where you had 178 older people in Cork, all sequenced with the same machine. And um, so this is a, a so-called Procostus analysis where you take two PCAs, one which is based on the gut microbiota composition, the other one is based on the diet from the same people. So it, it puts them together. So each line here is a person, uh, and the, the dot here is the, that person's diet. At the far end of the line is the person's microbiota composition. And these are all uh, people who were in the housing community. Uh, and then uh, we, some patients that were, uh, some, some people who were uh, in the long stay between the first, uh, for the first six weeks, uh, they started to see that they were here, not so much happening. And then there were those who were in, um, had been in uh, long-stay care for between six weeks and one year. Now, you can start to see here that the, the diet here are further away from the corresponding healthy diets, more so than what the microbiota uh, is doing. Uh, it's really hammered in here for those who have been in year one in long-stay. If I just filter those two extremes out, you can clearly see the gut microbiota is much higher uh, sorry, the, the, the diet changes are, are kind of have been driving, it looks to have been driving the, the change in, in gut microbiota because of, of these, uh, this trend we observe here. So obviously diet is, is very important for gut microbiota studies. Uh, this is from the same study here, um, this, but this is a PCA of diet only, so not microbiota. And then you can see, uh, it's from the previous plot basically, just taking out the diet. All the community here, long stay here. Um, if we, we uh, found a metric called healthy food diversity, where you can measure someone, get a simple metric for someone's um, uh, food, uh, whether uh, diet, whether it's healthy uh, and diverse. So this was po very positively co correlated with the gut microbiota diversity. So you can see down here in red, those are the uh, patients who uh, we're living in, uh, in long state care, care and they had both lower health food diversity and uh, gut microbiota diversity. Now, uh, so this finding was very significant. Microbiota is strongly associated with diet in, 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 these, in this cohort here, where we compare long stay with community. In more, uh, my more recent work on inflammatory bowel disease, we instead used uh, uh, biopsies from the colon, so not stool, uh, and also diet from 173 subjects. Uh, this is a PCA. It's the sa same type of PCA. The, the ellipses are simply 80% confidence intervals. You can see they overlap a lot, overlap a lot between healthy controls 
you, uh, you see patients and cross patients here. So we didn't see too much. This is a similar plot here, health plotting, uh, correlating cor uh, health through diversity with microbiodiversity. We found nothing significant. So no, the way we looked at it here, applying the same methodology as the previous study, we didn't find significant associations between diet and microbiota. Um, yeah, I should say this work is being done by uh, a big group, uh, and my PhD student by PhD student by uh, Fergus Ryan, which we recently submitted. Uh, in another, uh, my other PhD student, uh, Adam Clooney, uh, we're in pro uh, process of submitting this uh, in a much bigger IBD cohort of 1,400 subjects. Uh, so this is a PCA again, just about diet. Okay, so what is some we have long, it's longitudinal, so that's why I have these lines uh, between diet. Uh, people uh, within the same people on different time points. Now, in red here, you have the healthy controls. It's slightly perturbed up to the top right here, as you can see. Otherwise, it's quite a bit of overlap. Uh, in terms of uh, here, it might not be hard to read, but overall, the correlation between um, diet, uh, health food diversity and diet is, is slightly, is, is, is significant, a little bit significant. So, um, <coughs> so that's that. And, and uh, what I should say here, we were able to associate these uh, shifts here in diet with certain uh, dietary components. So we know that down here are very high sugar foods, taken more by some of the IBD patients. And up here, uh, uh, lots of fruit and vegetables up in this direction, eaten more by healthy, uh, healthy subjects. Uh, so we say it's a little bit significant. So we don't see the very significance up here that we did in this cohort in the IBD, but uh, it's still, I still want to um, point out that so not every dietary change seems to affect the microbiota the way we measure it. You can measure it in different ways. You can have different food questionnaires and so on. Um, and the effects seem to be stronger in stool than intestinal mucosa. So one hypothesis could, for that could be that uh, it's more responsive, what we, uh, the, the, what's in the lumen compared to the... Uh, responsive to diet compared to what uh, you have the mucosa associated microbiota, which is stuck to the cell wall, it may not be affected by a change in diet as much. Um, but I still want to em emphasize that it's very important to, uh, um, to include dietary information so that you can rule it out if you see a confounder. So that's what happened in the element project. We saw a big split between uh, community and long stay, and if we hadn't collected the dietary information, we couldn't have tied it to, to the change in diet. Uh, now, you can also ask if you want to classify, if you want to use for diagnostics or prognostics. So, we call it classifying uh, um, samples of patients in two different groups. Let's say if they're a relapse, a remission, or sick and healthy. Uh, it might also be possible to combine these diets data with other types of omics data. So, we did this recently in the Ryan et al. Uh, manuscript, uh, uh, Anna Hearn, my PhD student, uh, looked at this. So we took from the 173 IBD patients and controls. Um, uh, we have genotype, microbiota, and, and diet, and also the host transcriptome. So these are areas under the curve, uh, meaning the higher value, uh, it has the more classifying power uh, that combination of data has to classify between sick and disease. <laughs> So you can see in red here, the point 71, uh, it's when you combine microbiota plus genotype plus diet. That had a stronger uh, AUC than if you only had microbiota and genotype, which is further down here. And these are the main uh, drivers of the, uh, uh, the classification here. So in red are a bunch of bacteria that are, uh, and then white rice uh, here and white bread are other two dietary components that seem to have uh, be, be able to, to contribute to this classification between sick and healthy. Okay, so what do you do? Uh, when, when in my, I suppose I've depressed all of you here talking about all these different biases and confounders, but the good news is that you can do things uh, to mitigate that. Uh, first of all, read up. If you're about to start your microbiome study, read up about the known biases. Uh, there's plenty of literature out there. Use existing standard operating procedures for protocols. Um, uh, there are two international human microbiome standards and the human microbiome project manual procedures. They're easy to find online to follow those. And if you're doing something different than no one else has done, measure two types of things. You can then, uh, I, I recommend you to do a pilot study of 
subset of samples to compare the methods that you that you're interested in, and ensure consistency at every level. So I have so you mentioned you saw that the the handler of the mouse, uh, male or female, tried to get the same. I don't mix them up, and there, there are so many different levels uh, of methodology that uh, you need to sp spend some time thinking about how to keep that consistent. Uh, you can include negative controls, especially important for low biomass sub, uh, studies. Uh, I mentioned these um, contaminated uh, DNA extraction kits um, to have negative controls to make sure there's nothing there that shouldn't be there. And collect as much information as possible. So you have diet, talk about that, medication, demographics, lifestyle, <coughs> exercise, whatever. Uh, recently developed an app called Clean Food Calc, uh, which uh, uh, patients can uh, download to their iPhone or Android phone and and monitor. So, how what type of diet they have at a certain point in time and food portion sizes. So that means you can get nutritional value for each point in time they do this, and they they send that goes off to database where it's further analyzed. Uh, also important, don't if you have two uh, runs, sequencing runs, don't put all thick in one and all healthy in the other one. Okay, because of the, these biases between platforms, uh, you need to spread them up. You need to spread them across and randomize. So not just thick and healthy. Look at all the times, time points when they were collected and how they were sequenced and all that. Just randomize and keep track of them. And last here, uh, once you sequence, you should. Use uh, good statistics to check for these biases here, uh, and the, you know where they were on the batch, the plate position, uh, in what batch they were, what position on the plate, the different barcodes, what nurse uh, collected samples, what clinicians, lab person. Collect all this information so you can then check if you see a big cluster from one person who collected those samples. Then you need to start worry perhaps. Uh, find a stats heavy friend if uh, to help you with this. Um, Especially someone who's used to these type of data, of course. And expect the unexpected. So the unknown unknowns. Okay. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you. And if anyone have any questions.